Hi everybody. Uh, I want to thank you for subscribing and especially thank the people who are sending comments and asking questions. It's much more of an interaction uh, that way and I really enjoy uh, hearing from you. You know, I've been thinking a lot about, well, I always think about this, but I'm starting to write another book on the process of working through and really thinking about and reviewing cases and, and what seems to be the crucial factors. And I continue to be amazed by how prescient Alexander and French were back in the 40s in their groundbreaking research on short-term versus long-term psychodynamic therapy in Chicago. You know, they were wondering, is it even possible to do work of depth and significance that's going to have a lasting impact in a short period of time? And they found, yes, it was possible. And one of the factors that they identified <clears throat> was a therapist factor. And that was the therapist's ability to make flexible use of sound dynamic principles. And in many ways, Michael Balint and David Mallon at the Tavistock, who were doing research in the 50s, 60s, found the same thing. Um, in addition, they found, and really everybody working in this field, has found that having the patient in a crisis seems to create the sort of opening and sort of disequilibrium in their system that can allow for deep and rapid change. But what do we do in those cases where patients are not in a crisis? They're sort of stuck in their chronic suffering. <clears throat> and this is probably the majority of our patients. And, you know, depending on your particular practice, you know, you may also be treating a lot of people who have treatment-resistant disorders. In other words, they've seen many other therapists before, either got no help or a little bit of help, but they're still suffering. And so in, in so many of these cases, it's the patient's defenses um, that have really created and perpetuated their suffering. So in intensive short-term dynamic psychotherapy, particularly when patients have what we would consider syntonic defenses. In other words, they're highly identified with their defenses. They say, well, I'm just a rational sort of fellow. I mean, <clears throat> I don't really, you know, uh, have feelings. I uh, rely on my uh, intellect and my logical brain. Um, so this is a person who, first of all, conflates their defense with who they are. They think that's just the way they are. And in many cases, they're really aware of the benefits of their defense. And we have to help to acquaint them, first of all, with the fact that, you know, they weren't born this way. Uh, this is something they do in order to avoid anxiety and pain and guilt and all kinds of uncomfortable feelings and that doing so in a chronic and habitual manner is actually creating and perpetuating their particular symptomatic suffering. You know, whether it be depression or interpersonal difficulties, a lack of closeness or whatever. So again, very often we are working to acquaint the patient with the cost of their defense. But what do we do when the patient comes in highly aware that their anxiety and their defenses, whether it's ruminating or having compulsions, or um, are wildly dysfunctional? Um, these are folks whose anxiety and defenses are highly dystonic. In fact, they like really don't like this and they really want to get rid of it. And so these are cases where I think it actually is worth considering that we help patients befriend these defenses, embrace them, 
really come to deeply understand that there is a benefit as well as a cost to these defenses. So we all know that defenses have both cost benefit. And Lee McCullough used to talk about, you know, doing that cost benefit analysis and being very aware of acknowledging that defenses that may not work now and in fact may be perpetuating difficulties, keeping the person isolated and alone and miserable, were actually an attempt at adaptation and in fact perhaps even was a life-saving strategy at one point in the person's life. So even though they've outlived their usefulness and are creating other problems, it's very important right, to have this balanced view and to acknowledge that there is a benefit. And so I have been experimenting with this recently with a couple of patients who have highly, highly dystonic uh, defenses and symptoms, but their resistance to it, their hating it, not liking it, is actually keeping it kind of stuck. And so I'm just asking them if they're willing to do something that may seem paradoxical. Um, but to first of all create a little distance between their sort of observing self, this calm center that exists in all of us, and can they take this anxiety, this defense, this part of them, and put it at a distance, still in the room, you know, but we're going to sit down and have a chat. You know, maybe we can have some sort of detente, right? Instead of having the person locked in this internal battle that doesn't seem to be going anywhere and in fact seems to be uh, increasing their distress. And so I have found by just asking them to get curious about what this symptom or what this voice or this part of themselves is actually trying to tell them or communicate. Um, literally in every case and quite quickly they come to realize that even though let's say they have a very intense um, inner critic that they really hate and wish would go away but when we put the judgment aside and just say well let's just talk to this voice and see, you know, what's, what's up, you know, wh why, why is that, wh why are they talking to you in this way? What are they, in every case, they come to realize that this part of them is, is serving a protective function. Um, and then they also begin to realize, though, that that part is somehow very young, uh, you know, came on board when they were six or 12, and doesn't seem to realize uh, that they have grown up and matured and are really able to take over this function. So I think there really are cases where instead of continuing to fight and resist these defenses, I mean, I'm sure you've had this experience where the person says, I know I do this. I hate it. It's so stupid. I mean, I wish I didn't. I don't know. I mean, but it's like not doing what we hope it will do, you know, to help them turn on it so they'll be willing to um, connect with their authentic self. They kind of get stuck in that battle. And so I have found that by, you know, dropping the resistance to that part, to that feeling uh, that they don't like, and just getting curious about it and wondering what the function is, um, it really seems to not only um, break up, you know, the, the strength of this uh, symptom, but really kind of melts something. And, and, the, and it really aids in integration, which is certainly one of the sort of meta goals in most therapies right, is to help people who've been locked in conflict and kind of splitting themselves into pieces, right, to get on friendly terms with their different feelings and anxieties and to be able to integrate them. So 
Um, I, I hope this is a helpful discussion about, you know, when, when a patient is highly identified with their uh, defenses and it's highly syntonic, we might have to help point out, you know, that there are some negative consequences as well. But when patients are already um, very aware of that and are highly dystonic, but continuing to fight their defenses and their anxieties in a way that isn't helpful, I would suggest trying uh, some of these ways. Certainly internal family systems has a way of talking to these parts. Uh, Bruce Ecker's work on um, really looking at, again, the, the benefit, the unconscious attempt at adaptation and mastery that is kind of disguised in some of these symptoms is a very great importance in bringing uh, to the patient's conscious awareness. So um, I'd love to hear your take on this and your experience, and I'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.